My name is Stephen Middleton. In the summer of 2014, I had the great pleasure of driving across the state of Kentucky, documenting roadside attractions. From a ventriloquist museum, to Bible-themed mini golf, dinosaur world, to the tomb of a mysterious man. I visited these places in hopes of showcasing the last of the roadside attractions in Kentucky, but soon realized after the first documentary aired, these were far from the only ones. So I am once again hitting the open road to find more curiosities in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. How many more interesting places are spread throughout our state? And who are the fascinating people behind them that are keeping the curiosities of roadside attractions alive? The following documentary is a testament to those folks who are still out there keeping things a little weird and curious in the Commonwealth. The folks I call the last real Kentuckians. So hold on as we take a ride to showcase the Commonwealth and all her curiosities one more time. My first stop was in Van Leer at a picturesque little house filled with eerie relics and a very curious curator. I've had people that come in that seem to be somewhat revolted by some of the things here. I've had people come in that think this is the uh, greatest place ever. It's almost like an amusement park to them. I've had people that come in and they leave with almost a sense of wonder, having learned more about these things. Uh, it's almost like finding out that the monster under the bed isn't quite as scary as you thought. I think it's a dying art, and I do consider the roadside attraction to be a form of art. And the privately owned little uh, roadside attractions are unfortunately going the way of the buffalo. And I'm trying to keep this alive as long as possible. I know that you see a lot of places like this further south in Louisiana and uh, places like that, but this is the only place I know of around here that's a little roadside attraction people can just stop and enjoy. David Harrington, proprietor of the East Kentucky Museum of Mysteries. I started out years ago collecting the strange and unusual. Most of the artifacts you see around you here in the museum I've had for years before I even opened the museum. And at one point I said to myself, why not share it with the world? I've always been a bit strange and unusual myself. Um, even as a kid, I collected the strange and unusual. I was interested in ghosts, uh, lake monsters, the paranormal. And my love of the strange and unusual grew as I did until I had amassed a collection that's worthy of a museum. I'm actually a paranormal investigator. Uh, it's more of a family practice at the moment. I'm looking to expand and have a larger, more scientific group later on. Uh, we've done several paranormal investigations on local battlefields, and I do investigate houses for people who've had problems with the paranormal. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm the man to consult when it comes to the paranormal in Van Leer. Um, I know every haunted house in the area, I know every haunted battlefield in the area, and I'm more than happy to give anyone the information they want. Uh, I've had people from out of state actually come all the way here just to see the place because they read about it on the internet, because they heard about it in newspapers, etc. word of mouth. 
Um, I also have a steady influx of tourists coming into the area to visit other local attractions such as Loretta Lynn's Home Place, the Coal Miners Museum, state parks in the area, that sort of thing, and they hear about the place and they stop in. Well, there's a wide variety of the strange and unusual. I have everything from embalming equipment to Egyptian artifacts, Civil War artifacts. I have a display on zombies for all of the zombie fans out there. Uh, scalping knives and a Fiji mermaid. Usually it's, uh, it's tourists that happen by, like I said, people coming in to see other attractions. Um, your errant wanderers that happen up on the place and come in. The neighborhood kids love it though. <laughs> I think a lot of the towns in Kentucky, especially in Appalachia, are actually shrinking and becoming ghost towns. So who's to say what the future is going to hold? 20 years from now, this may be the same as one of the Old West ghost towns. I usually close a week after Halloween and I open on April Fool's Day. I'm open all spring, all summer, and all fall. Um, I'm a bit of a night owl. So I only open at 11 o'clock in the morning and I'm usually open until 8 o'clock or when I extinguish lights for the night. Just, just uh, look me up on Facebook and you can get on Facebook, look up the place and make reservations to come in, have private tours. I'm willing to work with anybody. Never having been to Carlisle, I decided to take a detour through the small town. I was surprised to find most of the original architecture still remains. Inside one of the old buildings, a certain storefront window caught my eye. I was a child who, who when I received dolls for Christmas and so forth, um, I was always pleased with them. I played house, which I don't know if little girls do that anymore or not, but we played house. But my part I enjoyed was setting it up, figuring out where things would go. We'd even do it with leaves in the backyard. We'd make rims. But I didn't grow up owning a lot of dolls. I have one doll in the museum that was mine as a child. When I became single at around 40 and had my own income and didn't have to ask anybody's permission to spend it, I started spending it on dolls. Well, I'm Jan Taylor, and I live right down the street, and my husband um, ran a cafe for many years here in town. And one of our customers was Philip Tibbs, who's a neurosurgeon in Lexington. And Philip was a regular customer, and he, one time when he came in, he said, he saw my growing collection of dolls, and he said, how would you like to have a doll museum? Well, I was still teaching then, but you know, it seemed like a dream anyway. It was easy to say, sure, that'd be fun. Um, we get we get people who are doll collectors who read about us. I advertise regularly in a couple of magazines that they would see. We get people who are staying at Blue Licks and who are looking for something to do while they're in this area. We get um, people who, like you, who are just wandering around the town and discover us that way. Um, and we, we got, don't get near enough people from the community. I wish that I had a way of taking a poll to find out how many people who live here have actually been in the museum. We started off with about 50 dolls that were my personal dolls. And very quickly, people in the community or people who saw another interview would call me and say, I have such and such, would you like to have it? And we now have about 900 and some dolls and 300 and some different kinds of toys. So fortunately for my pocketbook, they aren't all mine. <laughs> but I still buy because I'm a lover of dolls. So when I can, I buy things. But I'd say it's closer to two thirds have been donated. And a guy who came in just recently told me, now I wish you had more of the, of the hero figures, the He-Man and, uh, and I actually just brought home my grandchildren's stuffed ones, but that's not really what he was looking for. I think he was looking for what boys played with as dolls. But those kind of figures that you may have played with a child, there's still a place in here for them. 
probably I'm buying more toys than dolls now because I want to broaden the what's available to the public and toys that charm me are toys that have wonderful graphics. I have some dolls made in Kentucky that are one of a kind, um, primitive kind of dolls that I really, really like. And I've learned to love some beautifully sculpted German bisque dolls. I don't own, I don't think I own any French. The French dolls are the most expensive in the market right now, so. Oh, I, I really believe that there's something here for everyone, that we have, we have toys that people who never even knew that they could be intrigued by them will find that they are. Well, I, I see a triangle of, of interests that the same people would enjoy, one being Laurie Kagan Moore's Museum of Dollhouses in Danville, another in Maysville, the, the Kathleen Brown Collection of Miniatures, and this museum. I keep thinking some creative tour director needs to create a way to take people to all those things because they all have some of the same, they're, they're attractive to some of the same people. So it, it, I think it's amazing that there are that three, that good examples of what they are in, in Kentucky. So happy to see you here at the, the Kentucky Dawn Toy Museum in Carlisle, Kentucky. Uh, we're off Route 68 between Maysville and Paris, and a great place to stop and visit. A favorite stop of mine is Paris, Kentucky in Bourbon County. The last time we were here, we stopped to visit Mr. Aikman in his barber shop. This time I am back to see the place that Ripley's, believe it or not, called the world's tallest three-story building. You know, I think people don't, think people say, oh, it's tall, but I don't think that people notice that it's three stories, nor would they notice that it's taller than all the other three-story buildings. I would have to assume that somebody here in town thought it was tall and, and contacted Ripley's Believe It or Not, because they were all about sensational stories. And it's tall. It's, it's a tall three-story building, plus the parapet's gone. You know, that added another two, three feet, probably. It was built around 1891, and um, the man who commissioned its building had a saloon. Now, it's not clear if there was a saloon in this building, but he did have a saloon. But we know that Lavin and Connell had a grocery store here um, from about um, 1892 until 1918, World War I. Now, the, the upper two floors were always um, fraternal organizations, lodges of one kind or another. And um, they were here in the building at the same time as the grocery store. And there's wonderful pictures of the produce up here in the windows. I, I think I discovered that there was a parapet that is gone up on the top of this building. And so, I would think they would have measured that as well. Um, and the building is designed to look tall. Um, there are upright columns, and the, the layers of, of each floor is accented with these columns that lead your eye up. And the top is very intricate. And on the street side, you have this sense of going up. There, there are different ledges and different brickwork, which it's like a big crescendo. But on the non-street side, there isn't anything. <laughs> it hasn't changed a lot. When you look at the pictures, it hasn't. The, the outside is cast iron, and the people who were in business here have maintained the windows and the approach, and they've kept all the layers and, and all the, the height and, the, and the, well, the integrity of the building. Sometimes they paint it different colors. There was a sunflower motif or a flower motif in some of the medallions at the corners of the columns, and it was the Sunflower Restaurant for a while. Um, and I only remember it as a restaurant, but um, it hasn't changed much. It's just yellow now, it used to be red. Like if you Googled Paris, you get the world's tallest. I, I don't know that anybody comes for that reason, but I think it adds to the interest in Main Street. We have an architectural walking tour brochure that the Hope Home Museum has put out, and that's definitely what we say, you know, here it is. While driving through Pendleton County, an old wooden water tower caught my eye. Upon closer look, I discovered a man named Punky, an entire old time town that started out as a hobby. 
Yeah, a lot of people, they'll go past it and then they'll turn and come back. Then a lot of people just keep coming over because they like it. One guy, he lives over in Grant County, he just keeps coming all the time. He said, and brings people with him, you know. Well, my nickname has always been Funky, so in, uh, that's where I've been all the time. So we just had the bill to it, made it Funky bill. Well, I'm Charles Beckett. I'm from here at Falmouth, Kentucky. And I got started building and built the garage there first. And then we got the railroad the caboose. I had to give to me over in Shelby County. Brought it in here and refixed it up. And then as we went along, we just kept adding and we're, at, we're where we're at now. I started 2003. I work out on the roads and go to auctions and people bring stuff here and I buy it. And Sometimes people bring stuff here and I don't even have no idea where it come from, but I put it somewhere. Every building here is full of everything that what really belongs in it. I try to stay away from yard sale stuff. There's a little bit here, but not much. But I've always been interested in old stuff. And when I, once I got started, it just kept growing, growing, and, and here we are. No plans, just start, just took off. Never had nothing drawn up or nothing. We just, just started building. If people want to give me money, I said, no, that ain't what it's for. I don't charge them nothing. Then I've got a whole lot of stuff, but I can, I got chances to buy stuff what I got, but I don't always, uh, if I've run into something interesting and stuff. Like uh, this week we was blacktop and I talked to everybody along the roads and stuff. And uh, I bought a rock crusher this week. And then the, about a month ago, that's when I bought that wooden winch up there. Just, I talk to people, and, and if I see something said, I'll ask about it. Open 24 7. A lot of times they stop out there on the highway and take pictures and stuff. And whatever they want to do, I, if I'm leaving, go to do stuff. I said, there it is, y'all take care of it, I'm gone. Do what you want to do. I get a lot of ideas from Western Town. It's like in here, I got a coffee machine. You know how it sits on the end of the counter. I got one in here and people said, well, I've seen that before, sitting at the end of the counter and everything. That water tire was given to me. They come out of Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. Went down there and hauled in here and painted it up and redone it and set her up. I like the post office and, and all the John Deere's and the automobiles and stuff. Well, it just keeps going around through there. There's a, about everything. I've got one or two more buildings I want to build yet. Well, I got a, a, a Model A Ford mail truck and then I got a 1927 Buick. I made it into Beverly Hillbilly's truck, wooden spoke wheels. Then I got a 1931 Model A Ford. Then I got a 1947 Plymouth in here that was my school teachers when I went to school. I can go through here and tell you about where everything come from. I built this here. That's the reason why I like to keep everything inside. Cause if it's outside, it finally perishes. Cause this is a one time deal and there won't be no more. They don't make it no more. There are many people out there chronicling our great commonwealth and helping spread the good word about all of her beauty. My personal favorite, and who I feel is the originator, is Mr. Corey Ramsey of MapDot, Kentucky. Corey and his crew have chronicled every Kentucky county, town, and little MapDot in between. I caught up with Corey out on the road and interviewed him in his most natural habitat, driving around the state. I wanted to find out what fuels him to travel to every dot on the map and why others should do the same. So I got laid off in 2009. Okay. And um, didn't have anything to do. And you know, there's not a whole lot to do in Bowling Green once you pass the two or three places. And so I plopped out a map and said, I'm just gonna go on some hiking trips. Yeah. And so I wanted to see where the state parks were. And I'd go to those state parks, a lot of them I'd never been to before. I found out that uh, we've got 
some pretty country in Kentucky, a lot of rural country. And uh, that led to going to 100, 200 hiking trips across the state, seeing these rural areas and realizing that there's a lot not getting promoted, especially when you contrast it with what I'd see on, say, Facebook, um, Kentucky tourism page or something like that. They'd always get the curb appeal towns, Lexington, Louisville, Bowling Green, occasionally Paducah. I'm passing all these little bitty places and I grew up in a small town. Yeah. And so I decided that uh, I would start visiting not only these hiking spots, but these actual towns that I was passing through as well. What's the country store like there, you know? Yeah. What's the local fare? What's the personality there? And every little place has got their own story and reason why they're large or why they're not large or the near miss, the, the opportunity that came that vanished. So I, I wanted to, to start seeing what the story was in these places. And uh, MapDot kind of grew out of that. I, I traveled to these map dots, got pictures, got stories, and with all that information created a page, MapDot Kentucky. Of course, that, you know, leaked over into Instagram and. Twitter and this whole movement of my place matters too. Well, I've got a crew travels with me, uh, three others, Talia, Travis, Kelly. They've been with me since the thing started or just after the thing started. Pick a place and go for curiosity's sake. Everybody's got a phone, everybody's got an Instagram or a Facebook, and it's a been there, done that. And if you can, uh, you know, go to these places, just a random place you've never been to, it's almost as good as driving four hours to some place you've been every year since you were growing up. So uh, just just go. Um, it, it, but it is fun. I think it's, it's uh, limitless, uh, the potential places you can go, the potential roads you can travel. And uh, that's one thing that has kept me going is there's always that next bend around the corner. Well, there might not even be something there, but there used to be, and that's where it gets cool is learning the history. Yeah. Why of all these places did somebody start something here thinking it'd turn into something, you know? Back out on the road, I heard an unbelievable story about a town on the Ohio River that has a dog for a mayor. With all the barking over politics today, I just had to see what kind of hound was running this town. Well, it's the center of the universe. <laughs> that's all. That's all I can tell you. It. Uh, I think Rabbit Hash is the culmination of let's say a, fe a feeling. It's you know Rabbit Hash is not. It's just. It's kind of a feeling of that place you want to be, that place you want to sit alone in it for five minutes, forget everything that's going. It's kind of therapy. It's like, you know, you got aromatherapy, and I think this, this river must give off some kind of, they used to call it miasma back in the old days, but the miasma the river gave off was like mosquitoes and fog, and, but, it, you know, it's just something peaceful. It's something that um, actually gets into your soul and uh, lets you calm down. Hi, my name is Don Clare, and I'm the president of the Rabbit Hash Historical Society. And the Rabbit Hash Historical Society owns the small town of Rabbit Hash, Kentucky. Rabbit Hash is a, uh, it's about two and a half acre spot right on the edge of the Ohio River um, in western Boone County, Kentucky. It's across from Rising Sun, Indiana. Um, the whole town is centered around the uh, Rabbit Hash General Store. It's been in operation since 1831. Now it started out as, it was built by a local Grange organization. That was a agricultural social group of farmers. And, um, and what they did was they built that building there 
as a repository for their crops. So they'd, they'd bring their crops down here, store it in there until a steamboat came up or down the river. Then they would load it onto the boat. And then if the steamboats were bringing anything to this area, it would be offloaded and, and stored there. So it was a, like a co-op building. Um, and eventually, there was one fellow that kind of minded it. He eventually took over the whole building and turned it into a general store. So um, ever since 1831, this has been the pulse of this community. What we did, we decided that we were going to have a honorary mayor election. And what that encompassed was, you know, whoever wanted to be mayor of Rabbit Hash for a day, uh, you put in a dollar, and that's one vote. So that, that kind of took off. People were, you know, putting five, ten dollars, putting their name in. And then one fella decided, oh, I think my dog needs to be mayor. So he got on this campaign and sure enough he raised so much money that the humans all dropped out because they couldn't afford it and other dogs had entered the race and finally when it was all over the town made about nine thousand dollars and we got our first dog mayor that kind of made national news you know town has a has a mayor um, it was really international news. Uh, I had a call from a magazine in Germany, and this, uh, the guy that was writing the article, he could, I mean, I could hardly understand him. He had a very heavy accent. He, he tried to interview me, and he's saying, well, well, how can you have a dog from here? What does your president think? I said, well, you know, the president has nothing to do with it. This is our town, we decided to, and he just could not, get that concept that we that we elected a dog like how does he make decisions and so I don't know what happened to his story I never saw it but so eventually Goofy succumbed to old age and so we had another mayor contest and this happened to coincide with the first Obama election same year and we the same thing happened we uh, dollar a vote vote as much as you want um, instead of uh, not allowing any liquor near the polls we encourage liquor near the polls <laughs> you know have a shot of whiskey and, and vote for our candidate so that again raised about um, ten thousand dollars and since it was in the election year we had we had we were on the Jimmy Kimmel show with the candidates, um, Bob Schieffer from the Sunday morning, you know, political analyst got in and said something about our election. It just took off. I mean, it was great publicity and, and it was a great way to raise money for the town. So, I mean, she, she does what she wants. I think uh, she is considering, now this, this has not been put out in public. You're, you're going to break this story. <laughs> this is something. But she's getting tired. She's so fed up with these clowns that are declaring to run for presidency. I mean, she, that she's actually thinking of running for president of the United States this year, in 2016. Lucy Lou for president. You can leave Cincinnati and 20 minutes later, be right here, your blood pressure drops like 20 points. You can, re you know, you can sit and relax and feel no stress. And it's just a 20 minute ride from that, you know, that society stuff and the, all the pressures. And it's, you know, it's right here in our tri-state. I usually uh, to find a place with this kind of serenity and peaceful environment. You know, you'd have to drive four or five hours to get somewhere with this kind of feeling. So it's it's uh, it's definitely a tourist destination. Now I I uh, just would like 
you know, invite everybody to come see our little piece of, of the center of the universe and enjoy the place. And uh, as far as we can, as far as we're determined, we're going to keep it here for generations to come. So. While traveling alongside the Kentucky River, I saw a sign for a riverboat. I followed the narrow winding road down to the river, and that's when I saw the little Dixie Belle about to leave the dock. She used to race up at Fort Boonesboro whenever she, that's where we got her from back in 81. And uh, she used to race the little toot. Uh, I can remember riding this boat in the third grade and never thought I'd ever be piloting it. And, uh, but it's pretty cool, I like it. <laughs> I'm Bruce Herring. I've been captain of the Dixie Belle now for about 30 years here at Shaker Landing. Uh, the Dixie Belle, she was built back in 1970 up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and she was built for just what she is, an excursion vessel. Now, instead of being made out of wood, like the early steamboats of the day, she's made from steel plating. So she's pretty heavy, weighs in at about 28 tons, but only sets 22 inches in the water. We're one of the few true stern wheelers operating here in the state. We're the only one on the Kentucky River. Stern wheeler, um, we've got the big red wheel in the back that pushes us along. Um, with the wheel, you don't set as deep in the water like you do when you have a prop or a screw. So we can go in real shallow water. Uh, we can go over gravel bars, sandbars if we need to. Uh, if we had a prop, we'd rip it off going over it. Well, uh, it was May 3rd of 2010. We had the third worst flood for the river, and a large dock broke loose upstream, came down, knocked us loose from the moorings, and the Dixie Belle took off downriver without us. So fortunately, me and my brother were up in the parking lot and saw it break loose, so I had my boat with me. We were able to get ahead of it, get her tied off to the trees, and there we spent about, oh, seven nights tied off to trees. Uh, we actually had to put this boat on a trailer to get it back up here. What we have is a Cummins diesel, 68 horsepower, and it's driving a hydraulic pump, which supplies pressure to two hydraulic motors on each end of the paddle wheel. It gives us a top speed of about 12 miles an hour, and we burn less than a gallon of diesel per hour. If you enjoy nature, you definitely want to check us out. Uh, usually the last part of April to the end of October, uh, second to third week of October, that's when we start getting the fall colors, and that's when we really start getting a lot of people down in here. Well, I mean, there's very few places like this left in the state anymore. Got the wildlife, different types of plants and trees, the different type of fish that we have in the river. I mean, this is just a good all around place to visit. You definitely want to check us out.
Louisville is home to many interesting attractions. One most tourists know is the world's largest baseball bat. A few blocks and turns from the Slugger Museum is another type of world's largest bat. This time, it is the world's largest vampire bat. grandmother started a photography studio and um, in around at around 1920 my dad was a small boy and he was actually hit by a car um, and they received an insurance payout and they had $25 left over after the medical bills were taken care of so they took that $25 and invested in a few tricks and jokes to put in the waiting room of the photography studio and pretty soon people were coming to us a lot more for the tricks and jokes than they were for the Photograph, so we closed the photography studio and, and started calling it Caulfield's Novelty. Um, my brother and I are actually third generation, um, and our kids are, are actually working here right now. But um, as far as owners go, it was my um, grandmother and grandfather, and then my father and his sister, and now my brother and myself and our spouses. Well, the giant bat came into existence after Louisville Slugger moved in down the street, um, and they put in their own giant baseball bat out in front of the museum, and that's only about two blocks down from us, so we thought it'd be kind of fun if there was another giant bat on Main Street, so we, we uh, put the giant vampire bat outside, and so now we've got two giant bats on Main Street. We definitely have a very broad type of clientele. I mean, it, you, you have all sorts of different um, uh, customers that come in from the very strange to the, the very normal, but that's who we are. We, we try to, to have a little bit something for everybody. Well, I mean, it's really special for me, especially we'll have customers come in, um, grandparents that are bringing their, their grandkids in and say, my parents brought me when, in when I was a kid and I, I wanted to bring my grandchildren in. So it's really neat when you, when and, and we get that a lot. We hear that a lot from people and um, it's really, I think it's harder and harder to have an independently owned business and especially one that is kind of specialized like this. So um, I'm very proud of that heritage. I'm very proud that we're one of the, the few left, um, especially, I, I'd, I'd have to say that there's probably only a few in the country that have been around as long as we have been. Mac King and Lance Burton are both um, magicians that have gone on to become very famous and do very well for themselves out in Vegas. Um, and they, when I was a teenager, they were our magicians here in the store. So um, yeah, it's really neat to have a little bit of uh, a famous, famous former employees. And you know, when they're in town, they, they'll usually stop in and see us. Um, well, of course I love costumes. I love um, the accessories that we have to put together costumes for people. People will come in for an with an idea and we can help them put it together. And I love that. I love um, that we don't just carry costumes. We have all of the things that go with it. So from shoes, we carry costume shoes. We carry theatrical makeup. Um, and we have two makeup artists on staff who can help you pretty much do whatever you wanna do. So um, here lately in the world of reality television, the Face Off series has become really popular and people have really gotten into theatrical and, and special effects makeup. So we really specialize in that and I think that's a really unique um, feature of our store. And we have employees that are knowledgeable and have been here for a long time that actually know the product, where when you go into those temporary stores, they really just don't know the merchandise like, like our employees do. 
Well, I just tell people if you've never been in, it's really kind of an experience. It's not just a retail store. I mean, we have a ton of stuff to look at. Some of the stuff that we have is just, we, we made it for fun so that it makes it kind of an experience for people rather, just, rather than just a shopping destination. Cave City, Kentucky can be called Kentucky's curiosity capital. I got a chance to check out Funtown Mountain, a new park right off the interstate just a week after the park opened. Being situated right on Interstate 65 between uh, Louisville and Nashville, you're getting everybody who's passing from Michigan, coming from up from Alabama and Arkansas, uh, Tennessee, Georgia, uh, Indiana, Ohio, of course, being right so close. Uh, Funtown Mountain has the hopes of elevating the reputation of Kentucky quite literally, actually. Funtown Mountain is, is a totally new thing for this region. It's uh, entirely different than what's been here before. Uh, this, this area, Cave City, uh, Guntown Mountain, Mammoth Cave have always been uh, within an arm's reach of where I grew up in, in a small rural town in south central Kentucky, but it's, it's totally different now. My name is Charlie Morris and I'm a jack of all trades, master of fun at Funtown Mountain. I grew up in south central Kentucky in a small rural farming community that was literally an arm's reach from any tourist attraction that Kentucky had to offer. Stearns, Kentucky, Cave City, Kentucky, Mammoth Cave, and it's just starting off at a young age. I remember the first time I came to Cave City, I was five years old. I came to Guntown Mountain and it was the best thing I'd ever seen. I really regret ever coming back because the, uh, the tourism in this area declined to such a degree. And I came back when I was 14 years old. The midway behind us had disappeared and the haunted house had dilapidated and uh, the souvenir shop had dwindled down to a mere nothing and walls were were blocking off half the store. And uh, the petting zoo, I remember, it was just, it was the most pitiful thing I'd ever seen. And I didn't want to touch any of them. But. Uh, growing up here, or growing up, coming here rather, to Guntown Mountain, I have to say that I've got an attachment to the Wild West uh, uh, Main Street and uh, it's really hard to get away from that. I, as much as I'm looking forward to the things that are coming, it's kind of hard to absolve, absolve that attachment you know, from, from my memory. The haunted house is nice. I can remember being a child, uh, I wouldn't go through it. I was five years old and I got in the front door and I just backed out. I couldn't go through, I chickened out. And I came back again when I was 14 years old and still couldn't go through it. It wasn't until I got hired on here that I finally went through the haunted house. And uh, it really wasn't as bad as I thought it was as a child, but it was definitely fun and, and spooky enough to, to get you jumping. Uh, Funtown Mountain is uh, the, uh, the epitome in Cave City, or the epitome of uh, roadside America, especially roadside Kentucky. Um, I believe it's the only kind in, in the state that's situated so close to the road and so easily accessible. Um, and then the fact that it's these, uh, these kitschy little fun uh, slices of Americana, which are distractions from the real attraction, which is Mammoth Cave, of course, but this area used to be littered with them. And, and not, you know, not only this area, but the state alike, you have, um, you have the historic railway in Stearns, Kentucky. You have, uh, you know, you had Guntown Mountain, you have the Kentucky Action Park. You have all these things in this area which are trying to keep the uh, idea of, of family fun alive and uh, it's just not happening. So you absolutely will be one of the only ones and we hope that we're not the only one because we absolutely, while we feel like we're the birthplace of fun, we never want to be the monopolization of fun. I hope a kid comes here and leaves with the memories of Funtown Mountain that I have with me, the memories of Guntown Mountain and the memories of uh, the days of old of roadside attractions in America and in Kentucky. Uh, 
the lifelong memories that leave impressions uh, that you can never forget. As I said before, I regret ever coming back to some of these these uh, kitschy little roadside spots because they're not what I remember them to be, and and uh, and it's, it's, it's not the fault of memory. It's uh, it's the decline that we've seen in the tourism industry, and we hope to elevate the tourism industry in Kentucky and bring it to a level at which it was in its peak and in its prime. I hope when people leave Funtown Mountain that they leave with a dream realized and that they leave having had fun and the positive memory of being here. My name is Charlie, Jack of all trades, master of fun. Come see us at Funtown Mountain. Heading even further west in the central time zone, I saw what I thought looked like the Washington Monument in the distance. What is this place? Why is a giant obelisk in the middle of a cornfield? Only one way to find out. Yeah, five miles out, six miles out, you can see this thing sticking up in the sky. And depending on where you are, you can see it further away than that. Um, and then when they travel down there and they see it and they come in here, it's a wow factor. Um, and so that in itself makes it an interesting place. Well, in 1907, Dr. C.C. Brown from Smith Grove, Kentucky, came up with the idea that David should have a monument to him like Washington had to him, being the first president. So he pitched the idea to Simon Buckner, who was the governor at the time, and Simon, Simon Buckner was a Confederate general during the war. Simon Buckner agreed. So Simon Buckner went to the Orphan Brigade reunion and pitched the idea to them, and they wholeheartedly agreed. So at that point, the Orphan Brigade and United Daughters of the Confederacy started a fundraising campaign, and by 1917, they had raised enough money to start the construction of the uh, monument. Um, they had two stoppages, one in 1918 for World War I, and then they had another one a little later on because they ran out of funding. So they had to do some more uh, uh, fundraising. Uh, the monument was dedicated June the 7th, 1924. And it was modeled after the Washington Monument. Well, it was built to be the second tallest obelisk next to the Washington Monument. It is two thirds the height. Washington is 555, this one is 351. The majority of my people that see it on the highway and and want to know why would somebody build something like that in the middle of a cornfield and they come here and find out a center town. Um, but a great many come here because they're uh, cultural tourists uh, and we get them from all over the world. They come from all over the world here. I, I get different reactions from people that w when they see me and I tell them who I am, they actually turn around and walk out laughing. Um, I, then I have people that, that tell me, well, oh, I'm so glad I'm glad the state got it right and da 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 And then I got people that's a little miffed that, that, I got, that I'm here. Okay, my name is Ron Sidnor. I'm the manager of Jefferson Davis State Historic Site. Uh, this is the birthplace of Jefferson Davis. Um, Davis was born here June the 3rd, 1808. Uh, there's a church sitting right outside the park, and that church is sitting on his actual birth site, uh, Bethel Baptist Church. Well, I used to be the assistant manager of Lake Barkley State Resort Park. Um, and one year when my, me and the park manager was, was talking and, and this position was open. And I told him, I said, you know, I ought to apply for that position. He said, you ought to go for it. And we laughed and stuff. And I said, given who I am and what that place is, there's no way they'll give me that position. So we laughed it off and needless to say, I didn't apply. Well, the next year, the, my boss came to me and asked me to take the job. Um, and she based it off, and she really didn't understand what she was asking me to do. And, um, but she based it off the fact that I'm retired from the military and that I had, had a history degree. And uh, not knowing that my history degree was the colonial period through the Civil War. But, but, she, but because of those two reasons, she came to me and asked me uh, if I would take the job. And she brought another person with her from Frankfurt to help her argue with me that I should take this position. And um, so when she asked me to take it, I said yes, and it stunned her. So for about 30 seconds, so she couldn't speak. So uh, May the 16th, 2010, I took over uh, as a manager here. Uh, the 17th, the local newspaper came down and interviewed me. And a couple of days later, when it hit the AP, I got interviewed from every 
media from small town media to the New York Times. Want to know how and why. Well, a couple of weeks later, my boss comes down and she goes, let's go to lunch. She goes, I didn't realize this was a big deal. I said, remember when I started laughing? <laughs> I said, I knew it was a big deal. That's why I started laughing. <laughs> uh, it is the tallest of its type in the world because it's all poured concrete. Um, so the only rebar in there is at the very top where it cones to the end, to the tip. Well, what I can say uh, uh, about uh, working here is that um, there's more to the man than the Confederacy. And people need to come and learn his history before the Civil War, and they get a better understanding of the man. Um, uh, because, because like I said, those things that he did before the Civil War, you know, helped grow this, this nation. And, you know, some people, you know, they tell me, well, it sounds like you're glorifying him. No, I'm just telling the truth. You know, you know, you, if you're gonna be a historian, you have to be objective. Uh, I would say that it's one of the more interesting places in Kentucky because of the fact that, uh, just like you were saying earlier, that you never knew this place existed. Well, believe it or not, there's a whole lot of people in Kentucky that don't know this place exists. When I made Commonwealth Curiosities Volume 1, I thought I was showcasing the last of the roadside attractions in Kentucky. After finding 10 more curious locations, I realized that I was wrong. Kentucky and her unbridled spirit is alive and well. One thing I have recognized is now it is our job as Kentuckians to visit these places, support these attractions, and help spread the word about the people who run them and have kept them alive. Many things have been said about Kentucky and the people who live in it. The real Kentucky is in the faces, hearts of the people who continue to keep the Commonwealth and her curiosities thriving. The real Kentucky is inside all of us who take the time to seek these places out. In the age of shopping malls and corporate chains, it is up to us as Kentuckians to support these places, these people who dedicate their time and passion to keep the curious spirit of the Commonwealth alive. So I once again challenge you to hit the road. Search out these places that are off the beaten path one more time. Take the time to find your own curiosities in your county, town, and region. You never know what might exist right under your nose. Help show the world how great our Commonwealth is. And do one for yourself and remember the freedom that comes to us all out on the open road.